Hello, this is lecture 14b for Calculus 1, uh, Proving the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. My name is Scott Grizzard from the University of South Florida. So, all of our class, we've been building up to this big proof, um, which is the, the, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take a whole bunch of stuff that we've been doing all of the semester, and we're going to put it together to prove this very big theorem. Okay, so what is it we're trying to prove again? So we're trying to prove that if we have an interval, and if f is defined at that interval, and a is some base point, if f is continuous, and g is some antiderivative of f, then two things are true. The derivative of the area under the curve is simply f, and the area under the curve is g of x minus g of a. So I take any antiderivative, um, and I evaluate it at x and then at a, and I subtract, you know, the g of a from the g of x, I will actually get the area under the curve. Okay, so that's our big goal. But we need some pieces, and I encourage you to follow along in the notes. There are notes posted in the, there is a link to the notes posted in the description. I encourage you to click on that and follow along in the notes, but you're going to have to do your own drawings. All right, so the pieces that we're going to pick. We need this min-max function thing that we did a while ago. Um, and I'll remind you what the definitions of those are. Uh, but just remember that it gets you to the max. Um, it gets you the max after a, so here, and then before a. So at a, my min f a at a will always just be f of a. Um, and then I'm going to have here... Um, I'm going to get the max up to A, and then this is the max um, at any point after A. Um, and again, I had this kind of idea here. Here's the max function. Here's the min function. Okay. And then there were a couple properties of this thing. Um, if F is continuous, two things are happening. Both max and min are well-defined because of the extreme value theorem, and both max and min are continuous functions if, F, if the underlying function itself is continuous. And you can see that here, right? So here's this max function. I hit this, but, you know, I, it's either going to be f or some previous or previous value of f. So uh, it's going to be either f of x or some previous value of f of x. And as you can see, if the underlying function is continuous, both of these, the max and the min are continuous. Okay. Other stuff I'm going to need. I'm going to need two cops and a drunk. I'm going to need the definition of derivative. Both of those things came from, mo from module one. I'm going to need this idea from module three that if f prime of x equals g prime of x uh, for all x, then there exists some c so that for every x, f of x equals g of x plus c. Um, so that was that antiderivatives were simply vertical shifts of each other. And I'm going to need this idea from module four, which is that the lower rectangle is less than or equal to the integral, which is less than or equal to the upper rectangle um, when x is greater than a. Um, so um, I've got this idea where if I take one rectangle, I'm less than the, you know, the, the, the upper sum is always bigger than the integral and the lower sum is always less than the integral. Okay. So again, this is what we're trying to prove. So here's how we're going to prove this. And this is a very, very cool proof. So what we're going to do is we're going to prove part one first, and then we're going to use part one to prove part two. So let's prove part one. And as I said, this is a very, very, very cool proof. And it's a proof in pictures. Okay. So the first thing we need to, we want to show that the derivative of this function, um, the derivative of the area under the curve uh, from a to x of f equals f of x if f is continuous. And to simplify the notation, I'm just going to call this function a of x. Okay? And I want to show, and then I'm going to use the definition of the derivative, and I'm going to say that a prime of x equals the limit as h goes to zero of a of x plus h minus a of x all over h. Okay. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a picture here. And again, this is a proof in pictures. So you need, to, you need to do the drawings, okay? Now, let's look at a of x here. 
A of X is, so here's my F, and A of X here is the is the integral from A to X of F of T dt. That's the area under the curve written in area notation. So here's my base midpoint A, and here's X. So this green area is the stuff I'm interested in. Well, that's to go from A to X. The A of X plus H would be from A to X plus H, f of t dt, so it would be this whole integral from a to x plus h. So all of this area here. So that's everything. Well, let's look at this. What I want here is a of x plus h minus a of x. So if I do that, I'm, I'm, I want this whole green piece minus this light green piece. And that's going to give me that little bit of area right there. So the area from a to x plus h, from x to x plus h, is a of x plus h minus a of x. So by the diagram, I've got the a of x plus h minus a of x equals x to x plus h of f of t dt. So this is the piece that is actually, so that a of the top bit is now this. So a prime of x equals the limit as h goes to zero, of x from x to x plus h of f of t dt all over h. Okay, so that's the first bit. I'm going to simplify what I'm dealing with. Here's the derivative. I'm going to simplify it to this bit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a picture to get upper and lower rectangle bounds on this. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do the right-hand side here. I'll talk about the left-hand side at the bottom of it, um, but for right now, we're just going to deal with the idea of h being greater than zero. So we're doing with the right derivative, okay? Uh, the left-handed derivative, there's a small change you have to make, and I'll show you what that is, and then I'm going to ask you as an exercise to redo the proof with the left-handed derivative and all the pictures that are associated with that. But let's see about the right-hand derivative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this piece right here. I'm going to zoom in right here and look at what's going on from x to x plus h. So that's this bit here. Now, remember I had this min and this max function. Here is x. Here is x plus h. Now, I'm going to call lh this min from x to x plus h. And I'm going to call UH the max. So I've got a lower rectangle and an upper rectangle. Okay. And notice that my actual area from X to X plus H under this curve is trapped, right? So if I think of this as the actual area, notice that UH is bigger than that actual green area. And LH is going to be, that lower rectangle is going to be smaller. Okay, so for the formalization of it, I'm going to let LH equal min F from X to X plus H. And I'm going to let UH equal the max function from F of F from X to X plus H. And so what I have is LH times H is less than or equal to x to x plus h f of t dt, which is the area under the curve, which I had in green just a moment ago, which is less than or equal to uh times h. The, so I've got a lower rectangle for h and an upper rectangle from h. And you could see this right here. I did, I broke out the three, the three separate things if you need to see it. This really isn't, this is the picture I want you to keep in mind. This is just a breakup of this picture so you can see the three pieces. Okay. But those aren't the diagrams that are important. This is the diagram that's important. This is a clarification diagram. Oops. Okay. Now, h is greater than zero. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to divide through by h, and I'm not going to flip any inequalities. So I've got lh is less than or equal to this bit which is less than or equal to this bit. Well, let's just let top of H equal UH. And remember, UH is max FX from X to H. And the bottom is going to be the min. So the top is 
this bit here. The bot is this bit here. And the green thing is trapped between the top and the bot. Since F is continuous, everything in here is continuous. So the limit as H goes to 8 of top is going to equal the limit as H goes to 0 of max, which of F the x to x plus h, well, that's just the max of f of x to x plus h, which is equal to f of x. Likewise, the min is going to go to f of x as well. So you can see here the lower and the upper. Thus, by two cops and a drunk, I'm going to wind up with the limit of this thing in the middle being a prime, which is a prime right of x is going to equal f of x. So what I did was I took the upper rectangle and the lower rectangle. I took the upper rectangle and the lower up rectangle, and then I just moved h all the way, um, I moved h to zero, which means x plus h went all the way back to x. And when I did that, the upper and lower rectangles both head to the same place. They both head to f of x, which means the derivative was simply f of x. So I used this thing, two cups and a drunk, from the very beginning, and I just shoved everything back over. That's very cool, isn't it? So the big idea here, now let me just finish this off, and then I'll talk about the big ideas. Note that if, if h is less than zero, I'm dealing with negative area. So LH um, times h is going to be greater than, because this will be less negative, right? I'm left of the base point. So I'm dealing with negative area. So this right here is going to be greater. The lower rectangle is less negative than the area, which is less negative than the upper rectangle. Okay, and since h is less than zero, when you when you divide through by h, you flip all those inequalities, and you're back to the exact same uh, inequality you had before. You apply two cups. Okay, so that's the proof of part one. What's the big idea? The big idea is to use the pictures. So the big idea is I'm going to do a proof in pictures, big ideas, and I'm going to apply two cops to the upper and lower as h goes to zero. And that's the proof for the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Again, you need to do redo this. You're not going to see it unless you rewrite it for yourself, but rewrite it and, and think about what's going on if x is less than if x if h is less than zero so if x plus h is on this side of the x so go ahead and rewrite it with that in mind and you'll see it okay now proof of part two which is the you know the part that everyone really wants to deal with is kind of an afterthought it's a rabbit proof and the rabbit okay so i'm gonna let a of x be the exact same thing before, and I want g to be some antiderivative, and I want to show that the integral from a to x of f of t dt equals g of x minus g of a. Well, two things. One, a of x is another antiderivative, right? a prime of x equals f of x by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay. So I'm just going to define a of x to, uh, to be that. Now, the rabbit is that a to a has no width. So the area under the curve from a to a is simply 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simply add the rabbit. So let's look at that. Let's see. I'm going to take a of x, and I want to show that a of x equals g of x minus g of a. Well, a of x equals a of x minus a of a, because this equals 0. I've got no width.
All right, this is the the integral from a to a of f of t dt. All right, well now, and I did the t because I've, I've already used x and I've already used a. So I just did t here. So for all t, a of t equals g of t plus c because g a prime of x equals g prime of x. And by the, fund, by the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, a prime of x equals f of x. And g prime of x is a function, right? It's some antiderivative for f. That means g is a function so that g prime of x equals f of x. So these are both antiderivatives of the same thing. So now I'm going to have g of x plus c minus g of a plus c. Well, of course, the c's are going to cancel. And I'm left with g of x minus g of a. And that's what I wanted to show. Okay, so again, fundamental theorem of calculus, just an afterthought, it's a rabbit proof. And all you need is the fact that you, the pieces that you need, you need the fact that a prime of x, this is where I used FTC1, you need a prime of x equaling f of x. And then you need the fact that if g prime of x equals f of x and a prime of x equals f of x, then there's some c so that those two are just vertical shifts of each other. Um, there's some c so that for any t, a of t equals g of t plus c. And then all you do is you do, you add the, you, well, you subtract the rabbit in this case. And then you just, you know, set everything. Here's a of x. You put that to g of x plus c. This is a of a, g of a plus c. You cancel the c's and you're left with g of x minus g of a. So it's a nice little proof. Um, and if you have the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, you don't need to muck around with all of the, the book has a proof, which is interesting as well. Um, they call it the evaluation theorem. It, <coughs> it has a proof where you use the mean value theorem to do this part, part two first. But part one is much more intuitive. The proof without part two is much more intuitive. And then part two just becomes a little rabbit proof. Okay, so that's the proof of the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. Um, go ahead, download the notes, and again, do the little exercise. And then next time, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about um, we're going to be talking about uh, use substitution and undoing the chain rule. Okay, that's all I have for you. Uh, thank you, and goodbye. See you next time.